Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, folks. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, depending wherever you are in the world joining us. Uh, welcome to Guide London. My name is Fiona and I'm one of 600 or so Blue Badge Tourist Guides here in London, members of the Association of Professional Tourist Guides. And uh, we are Guide London and we've been bringing you these uh, these half hour broadcasts for, uh, for just over a year now. Um, and today is International Museums Day, which is very exciting. And we have got a, a museum connection to our talk uh, this afternoon. Um, but it's also very good timing because right across England uh, this week, a lot of our museums and galleries are opening their doors once again. And it is, uh, again, very exciting. I know quite a few of my colleagues uh, yesterday went racing off to visit their favorite uh, museums and, and galleries and just, check in and make sure it's all still there and it's all still lovely. Um, so lots of places open. Um, almost all of them are requiring you to book ahead. So if you're interested, if you're near London or in England and you're thinking about visiting somewhere, um, do have a look at their website. The ones that are free are still free, um, but they uh, also do need you to book ahead because it's about managing uh, numbers which also means they are kind of limiting the number of people who can visit on any one day and so it's a really good time as a visitor to head into those museums because uh, you'll have potentially a bit more space and things so uh, yeah go go and explore but have a look on people's websites first of all um, and today for our talk we are heading back to uh, the east end of London and I think traditionally visitors to, to London are probably drawn more to the bright lights of the West End, uh, you know, the theatre district, the shops, the, the lots of the restaurants and things. Um, but in the last 10, 15 years or so, a lot of people have uh, really been sort of discovering the East End. And it's always been a fascinating area with lots of stories, but um, they're, they're just sort of appearing onto the radar for a lot of people uh, coming to London for the first time. And we've talked about them in our broadcasts already. We've talked about street art in the East End. We've talked about the Jewish East End. And uh, today we are going to talk about two women, really inspiring, uh, very interesting lives. And the thing that they share is uh, a strong connection to the uh, to the East End. Um, so we are going to be talking um, about Annie Besant and Sylvia Pankhurst. And in fact, I lied. We have three fantastic women uh, today because uh, to tell us all about the other two, we have Laura Adams. Hello, Laura. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. What a lovely welcome. <laughs> Um, so before I hand over to, to Laura, as some of you already have, hello, hello uh, folks from Suffolk and uh, Casablanca and Malaysia already tuning in. But do do put your questions for Laura in the chat and say hello. If you're watching us live, say hello. Tell us where you are. It's such a one of the lovely things about these broadcasts that we can kind of feel like we're connecting with you all around the world. So do pop stuff in the chat as we go along. And having said that, I will hand you over to Laura. Thank you, Fiona, and hello, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be giving this talk on Guide London today. I am a London Blue Badge Tourist Guide, and I have been guiding for five years. And uh, of course, uh, for the last year, we've not been guiding so much, so we've been virtual, but it's so exciting that London is opening up. And um, what a great day on International Museums Day to, uh, to be giving this talk. And I'm going to be telling you about a very special museum opening in the East End at the end of the talk. Now, I'm a guide because I love London. I love its history, I love its culture, its buzz, and of course its museums. And um, most of all though for me, I love the people. And I am particularly interested in women's history and that's why in lockdown I started up a new venture called Women Inspire, and it's to tell the story of inspirational women throughout history, especially those 
whose stories have been forgotten. And it's a podcast, it's a blog, and of course, it's women themed walks of London. And we guides have been so excited about getting back out into the city to do these walks. And as Fiona said, the East End is such a vibrant, exciting, interesting part of the city that not everybody knows about. I'm going to talk about two great heroes of mine today. I'm going to talk about Annie Besant and about Sylvia Pankhurst. Annie Besant, oh, socialist, theosophist, orator, educationalist. I mean, her talents go on. And she's most well known in this country for spearheading the match girl strike of 1888. And then Sylvia Pankhurst, part of the uh, well known Pankhurst family. Yes, she was the rebel suffragette, but she was so much more than that. And these two women fought injustice throughout their lives and they have a lot of parallels which is why I've chosen to talk about them today and to touch on how they uh, were drawn to the East End of London. So let's go, here's a map of the East End of London which dates from 1882 and what's interesting is if you look in the southeast corner southwest corner rather, uh, you will see the Tower of London. And the Tower of London, this is where the sort of boundary of the City of London is. The City of London in the 1800s was the beating heart of the British Empire. It was incredibly powerful and incredibly wealthy. But bang next door is the area we're looking at now. And that was the East End. This was poverty stricken, crime riddled. Uh, it was had a very high infant mortality rate. There were many slums. And this is the area these two women were drawn to. And if you look at the bottom there, you can see the River Thames as it snakes through London. And you can see the docks and the docks were a very important part of this area. So let's go to our next, our first woman, and that is Annie Besant. Now, Annie was actually born within the sound of the Bow Bells, and that means the bells of St Mary Le Bow in the city of London. And if you are born within the sound of the Bow Bells, you are meant to be a true Londoner or a true Cockney. She spent the first few uh, years of her life in London, uh, in the centre of London, but sadly her father died and also her little brother died and the family moved to Harrow School. Now Harrow School is a public school, but in this country what we mean by a public school is a private school, a fee-paying school. This is a very illustrious boys' school. Past alumni include Sir Winston Churchill, uh, Nehru, more recently Benedict Cumberbatch, the actor. And uh, anyway, they settled there because her mother ran a boarding house and she was very, very happy there. She used to climb with the boys, she used to play cricket with the boys. But her favourite thing to do was to go and sit on Byron's tomb. And this is the tomb that Lord Byron, when he was a boy at Harrow School, he would go and sit on this tomb and look out over this beautiful Hertfordshire countryside. So if you imagine, we've got London behind us and we're looking out to the sort of Northwest. And she would do the same. She'd sit there and she would recite Byron's poetry and Milton's Paradise Lost. And these were signs of things to come. Now, she married a man called Frank Besant, and he was a cleric, and they went to live in Lincolnshire, a place called Sibsey, and sadly, they were very unhappily married. In fact, I've got a, a, a quote that she says, it's very sad, she knew instantly when she accepted the proposal, when she said yes, she went, oh, I've done the wrong thing. And she said, out of sheer weakness and fear of inflicting pain, I drifted into an engagement with a man I did not pretend to love. So it's sad, isn't it, really? So she went up to Sibsey. She did a lot of good work for the poor up there. Um, they had two children. She had a daughter, Mabel, and a son, Digby. But they were very unhappy, and the marriage started to fall apart. One day, she was in Sibsey Church and she was playing the organ. And 
on a whim, she decided to climb up the pulpit and she started to speak to all these rows of empty pews. And it was like an epiphany. She suddenly found her voice and she realized there, were, there was power in this voice and that she wanted to do something with it to help people. So she left Frank and she went down to London and she took Mabel with her. While she'd been in Sibsey, Mabel had got very ill. She'd had whooping cough and nearly died. And this had given her a crisis of faith. She lost her Christian faith and she became an atheist. When she was in London, she befriended uh, the gentleman on the left, Charles Bradlaw. And uh, he was part of a group of uh, political activists and he was a leading part of that group. And her atheism became very strong and she began to speak about it at uh, public meetings and there'd be a lot of violence that she'd be uh, sort of things would be thrown at her she'd have to sneak out the, the, the back way but she was a brilliant speaker and George Bernard Shaw who's the Irish playwright that you can see on the right here he claimed that she was a very great actress she was uh, generally known as being a brilliant speaker now Annie and Charles Bradlaw, they published a pamphlet about birth control. She was a great advocate for birth control. The population in the first half of the 19th century had doubled and there was a real issue. So they published this pamphlet, but it is met with an outcry. And uh, she is up in court on charges of obscenity. And although she was found guilty, the charges were dropped, but it gave Frank the opportunity to come and take Mabel and on the grounds that Annie was atheist and that she was pro birth control and she lost her daughter. And she writes very movingly about how her daughter was sort of dragged from her screaming. It's incredibly sad. And she had a nervous breakdown at this point. Now, Annie uh, did later have a, a relationship with George Bernard Shaw. They uh, thought about cohabiting, but he was a famous philanderer. So she wrote, uh, she wrote some, uh, what did she say? He said, she, she wrote some various rules that he had to follow. She said, and he said, good God, this is the worst, this is worse than all the vows of all the churches on earth. I had rather be legally married to you 10 times over. So that put pay to their cohabiting. So, moving on. Now, it brings us to 1887. This is Trafalgar Square, a lovely view of Trafalgar Square, and of course, one of the fantastic museums that is now open, our National Gallery there. In 1887, this was a centre of protest, as it sometimes is today, and there was a lot of unemployment, there was a lot of unrest, and the police had cordoned off Trafalgar Square uh, so that these people who were protesting weren't allowed there and there was an uproar. The protesters met in Clerkenwell and Annie great, gave a great rousing speech and they marched to Trafalgar Square. But once they got there, they went into the square and a riot ensued. 300 people were arrested, 150 people were injured. Annie tried to get herself arrested, but uh, uh, to no avail. They knew she was trying to uh, make herself a martyr. And uh, however, she set up a defense fund and she did all she could to help those affected uh, who'd been uh, imprisoned and injured. So she was extremely politically active. And the following year, she heard about the Bryant and May match factory in the East End of London. And she heard that they were treating their workers very badly. They had terrible conditions. The wages were very poor. And the worst thing of all was that they were using white phosphorus. And white phosphorus was very dangerous. Many of the workers were getting fossy jaw and that was basically their jaw was sort of uh, being eaten up and they would have to have the jaw removed and if not you know they could die of a, of a really very unpleasant death indeed. She went to the factory, she talked, most of them were women, so she talked to the women and uh, they told her their grievances. Now, Bryant and May tried to get them to sign something to say that uh, they were perfectly happy with conditions. And at this, they just walked out. 
1,400 workers eventually walked out of the Bryan to May factory and for three weeks they were on strike and Annie supported them through that strike and eventually the Bryant and May bosses had to sort of give them concessions. Having said that white phosphorus was actually used for another 10 years and it was until ni- until 1907 that it was finally banned. She did all sorts of other things. She was the first female um, member of the London School Board, so she was very important in education. She also supported the dock strike um, and and helped the dockers get better wages. Um, And this picture here is rather lovely because this is in the East End of London. And if we were going on a walk now in Bow, we would be going and visiting this because this is the building that used to be the Bryant and May Match Factory. And just look at it today. It's a gated community, it's townhouses, it's apartments. It's been really sort of uh, renovated and made, and made to look beautiful. But what a fantastic place to live um, uh, in that sort of bit of history, really. And on the left, you can see a blue plaque, which is uh, remembers Annie Besant and those incredible, brave, brave women who went on that strike. OK, so. Annie was interesting. George Bernard Shaw said of her that she bounded into different movements. And at this point, she bounded into theosophism. And the reason was that she read a book by this lady here on the left, Madame Blavatsky, called The Secret Doctrine. And it was all about theosophy, which was this religious movement, which was based on Hindu ideas of karma and reincarnation. And Annie read it. And she knew, she said it was like going through a storm into calm. And she knew that this was where her life should be now. So she moved to India and she did all sorts of good things in India. She helped women. She was very instrumental in setting up schools for girls. She was very much admired by Mahatma Gandhi, who you can see here, and Nehru as well. And she was a great supporter of Indian independence. In fact, she led demonstrations and eventually the British colonial government imprisoned well they arrested her and she was in prison and there was such an uproar she was so well loved by the Indian people that they had to let her out and at this point she became the president of the first female president of the Indian National Congress and when she died she had a Hindu traditional Hindu cremation and all over India things are named after her. This is a park in Chennai which is named after her. There's roads, there's buildings and in fact in India they know her name better than we do over here. So Annie Besant, incredible, but let's move on to our second hero of mine, Sylvia Pankhurst. And Sylvia Pankhurst is one of the Pankhurst family, the famous Pankhurst family, who were Emmeline and Christabel, who founded the WSPU, Women's Social and Political Union, and were the important uh, militant suffragettes. And she was the second daughter. She was always a bit of an outsider. She always felt a bit of an outsider. She was born in Manchester, but when she was very young, they moved to London. And this is a picture of Russell Square, right in the heart of London, in a beautiful, beautiful part of London called Bloomsbury. And the building you're look at, looking at is actually a hotel called the Kimpton Fitzroy. That wasn't there then, they, but they lived on a house on that site. And at this point, they were the hub of a great group of radicals. So there were all these sort of free thinkers, whether they were abolitionists, feminists, and Sylvia was very influenced by them and very aware of the importance of her parents' work because her father, who you can see there, Dr. Richard Pankhurst, he was a barrister, a scholar, great campaigner for women's rights, and Emmeline, of course, the indomitable leader of the militant suffragettes. So she was very aware of this and and her childhood was spent during the growth of the socialist movement. So she, when she got to about 16, her father died sadly and uh, she was very traumatized by it. She was on her own with him because Emmeline and Christabel were away and she had to deal with it on her own. And uh, she adored her father. And her father said to Sylvia, he said, 
if you do not work for other people, you will not have been worth the upbringing. And that's something she remembered all of her life. So here we've got a lovely picture of Emmeline, Christabel and Sylvia. There were other children. There was a younger daughter, Adela, who ended up living in Australia. And she had two brothers as well. One died very young and one died at the age of 19. But this is a picture uh, when they've already, you know, the WSPU has started up the suffragette movement that they started, which had working class roots. It started in the front room of their home in Manchester. And Emmeline and Christabel became a formidable duo. Christabel, very charismatic speaker. Uh, Emmeline, sort of an extraordinary sort of figurehead at the head of this movement. And Sylvia, but Sylvia had another vocation because she was an incredibly talented artist. She went to the Manchester School of Art. She had a scholarship. Then she went to the Royal College of Art. And she really struggled within herself because she loved her art, but she felt she had to help people. Her great friend, uh, Kia Hardy, she wrote to him and she said, is it just that we should devote our entire lives to the creation of beauty while others are meshed in monotonous drudgery. And she had a calling. She knew she had to work with the working people. And later on, the WSPU would become very upper class and sort of aristocratic. And that wasn't where she wanted to go. She wanted to remain true to her socialist roots. She eventually decided she was going to join the suffragette movement, and she became the designer of the movement, which is why I've put the Holloway brooch there. Because so much of when we think visually of the suffragettes, so much of that was her creation. And if you look in the middle of this medal there with the suffragette colours, the green, white and purple, look at the brooch, which is a portcullis, which is the symbol of parliament. And on it is a prisoner's arrow with the three colours of the WSPU and that is her creation but that's just one of uh, many of her designs for the suffragette movement. Now the suffragettes of course uh, they did uh, become very militant. Uh, this actually on the left the Daily Mirror that is a picture of Black Friday. This was a horrific event. The suffragettes were very angry because a bill that meant that wealthy women would have got the vote had been shelved. So they came furiously to Parliament, but they got into fights with the police and they were treated atrociously. They were beaten with truncheons. They were thrown into the hostile crowd. And there were instances where they were dragged up side roads and they were sexually assaulted. So it was a, a, a horrific, horrific event. They were taken to Caxton Hall nearby, which you can see today if you're on a Westminster walk. Um, that was the headquarters of the suffragette uh, movement and the, certainly the WSPU and their injuries were, were treated there. On the right, I've just popped a, a, a photo of Emmeline and she's being arrested outside Buckingham Palace. And you can do fantastic walks of Westminster, great suffragette walks of Westminster. So one of the things that people always associate uh, the suffragettes with is the hunger striking. And Sylvia was the most force fed suffragette of them all. She was arrested eight times between 1913 and 1914. Um, it was a horrific process. I won't go too much into that now, but it did incredible damage. And so many of these women, you know, had suffered uh, from ill health throughout their lives because of the damage it had done. And uh, there are all sort of unmentionable other things that that they did to the women and even one was uh, driven to attempt suicide and in fact Sylvia did have a breakdown but she was incredibly fearless and resilient and she would carry on first strikes so she'd stop drinking she'd do sleep strikes so she'd just walk up and down her cell um, she was pretty formidable uh, eventually because there was a bit of a, a an uproar in the country about the force feeding the government brought in the cat and mouse act which meant that they would release a hunger striking suffragette 
only to imprison them again when they were healthy. Now, as I said earlier, the WSPU had become very much an upper class organisation. And Sylvia wanted to stay true to the working class roots. And she had been very much drawn to the East End. And she now set up the East London Federation in the East End. And Evelyn and, and Christabel were rather furious about this. And they were, she was summoned to Paris, where Christabel was uh, taking refuge, uh, escaping, being arrested. And she expelled Sylvia from the union. So Sylvia went back and she carried on her own thing. And uh, we've got some nice pictures here. Victoria Park is where many of the suffragette demonstrations took place. On the top left hand corner, you've got an annual report, which is the first annual report from the East London Federation. Below that is Bromley Town Hall, and this is where the East London suffragettes would hold their meetings, and quite often they would be arrested there. And that, of course, will be on a walk of these incredible women in Bow. And just opposite that building, a bit further down the road, is the, ro the building on the right with the red brick. And that is Bow Road Police Station, and that, of course, is where the suffragettes would be taken. Now, on the next slide, we have a beautiful mural by Jerome Davenport. It's been there since 2018. It's a gift for a guide. It's fabulous. It really conjures up the fact that of this, uh, the importance of the, the suffragettes in this area. There you see Sylvia, and she's on the Lord Morpeth pub, and that pub was in existence at this time in the early 1900s and the suffragettes would go and have a drink at that pub and Sylvia had a, a place next door where she lived it doesn't exist anymore but it's where she set up the, a woman's hall and walk we can oh yeah walk that's fine thank you Fiona war came and this is world war one world war one broke out now the WSPU huge supporters of the war, they instantly stop campaigning and they pull, they uh, give the full weight of their support to the war effort. Sylvia is a pacifist. She doesn't believe in the war. So she says, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all my energy into working with these women who've been left financially sort of destitute while the men are away fighting. So she set up cost price uh, sort of restaurants so very cheap food for the women she set up mother and baby clinics all sorts and she set up a toy factory and this is where the toy factory was she uh, gave decent wages of no less than five pence an hour and they made some rather beautiful wooden toys there and it gave them a proper uh, proper employment, if you like. So she did a lot of good during the war, but she was very strongly pacifist. She didn't agree with it at all. Now, when the war ended, Sylvia threw herself into so many different causes. She threw herself into communism. And believe it or not, after the Russian Revolution, she smuggled herself to Russia. She had no passport, but she managed to get to Russia. She got to the Kremlin. She went into the Kremlin and she spoke with Lenin, who's uh, who's there on the left. And they had quite a heated debate. And uh, he actually found Sylvia Pankhurst. Believe it or not, he found her too left wing. But uh, he knew that she was going to be a very important part of the formation of the Communist Party. And indeed she was. But ultimately she was actually expelled from the Communist Party because they, uh, they, 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 uh, they disagreed about certain fundamental elements. She was also the editor of the Workers' Dreadnought, which had been the Women's Dreadnought. But when it became the workers' dread, dreadnought, she employed the first black journalist in this country, and that was Claude Mackay, who'd been an incredibly important figure in the Harlem Renaissance, and there he is in the middle. She was actually arrested shortly after that because she um, was accused of sedition, and she was in Holloway again for another six months for writing anti-war propaganda. 
And then on the right, you can see her protesting against English policies in India. And there were so, so many causes that she threw herself into. But she also met the love, uh, uh, another love of her life. She, Keir Hardy was the first one, but she met Silvio Corio, an Italian radical, and they had uh, a son together when she was 45 years old. And here we are, she ended her life in Ethiopia because one of the causes she was most passionate about, about, passionate about was that she was very anti the fascist Italian invasion of Ethiopia. And she did a huge amount for that country. And in fact, so much so that at the end of her life, Haile Selassie, Emperor Haile Selassie invited her over and she spent her last few years in Ethiopia still dedicating herself to various causes. And so in, the, the country held her in so much esteem that she was given a great state funeral and uh, she was uh, had the honour of being called a, an, an Ethiopian by Haile Selassie and she's buried just by Trinity Cathedral you can see it right here so that brings us to the end I just want to I, I like to finish on this picture look at these two incredible women and I hope I've shared with you how passionate I feel about them I think they're extraordinary and today that picture in the middle is a recent picture uh, of a protest injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere and if they were here today they would be at the forefront of all these protests black lives matters me too climate change they would be there right at the forefront um, and what an incredible uh, couple of women they are now I'd like to finish the presentation by just telling you very briefly about the East End Women's Museum. And here it is. And they are a fantastic group of women. They have been um, setting this thing up for about five years, but they now have a physical space. You've got loads of information online. You can go on Twitter, you can go on Facebook. And uh, yeah, by all means do, they would love you to follow them join up their newsletter and a big shout out for them on International Museums Day. And I think that is the end. So thank you very much. It's been really great to talk to you today. And if you're interested, please do go to Women Inspire, which is uh, my website with the podcast and the blogs. And we do talks and, uh, and of course, Women Themed Walks of London. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. That was so fabulous. I mean, they, they are just absolutely kind of inspiring it just makes you think right I'm, I'm gonna go out there and do and something I know I know you feel a bit like oh gosh what have I done but I just I, I think they're just I love their fearlessness I think they're fabulous yeah absolutely um so we haven't, haven't um had any any questions as such if anyone does have a question you can pop it in the chat still um, but lots of people saying thank you so much really interesting talk um uh Edwin saying Thank you uh, for. Uh, oh, so Andrea was making a comment earlier on about uh, other people. So, but two two feisty females there. So yes, um, so we've got Andrea from Virginia, and there was a bit of chat about stuff that she's doing. Um, Nikki was saying about uh, more information you can find about you know East London suffragettes and things. So lots of people really um, uh, interested. And Victoria has visited her grave. Anything? Wow, Victoria, that is amazing. I'll have to talk to you about that. That sounds incredible. Love to hear about it. Yeah. So, um, so yes, if you want to find out more. So, Laura, you, you do a virtual tour about women, women in the East End. I've got one coming up, actually. You can get details on the Women Inspire website, which is Trailblazers of the East End. And it includes these two women, but it also includes uh, lots of other women because the East End is, is in, like a magnet for trailblazing women. And it's called Trailblazers of the East End. So, yes, I've got that coming up, yeah. um, as well as obviously the real walks that are coming up as well. So Yes, absolutely. And so we are, um, again, if you're near London, if you want to come and join uh, us on, on physical walks, uh, you know, lots of Blue Badge Guides are out there again doing, uh, up on our hind legs, doing actual kind of uh, walking tours and things. So, yeah, look up look up um, Laura's website, but also the other way to get in touch. So there's, there's Women Inspire, or of course, you can also go to the Guide London website here. And then uh, if you just go to the search button up the top here, uh, box and spell it right 
then uh, you can um, find Laura. So there we are, one of one of three Lauras we have amongst the uh, APTG uh, who will happily show you around. And I'm sure from, from Laura's profile, you can then find uh, the Women Inspire website as well. Yeah, so, and uh, again, you know, if you are interested more in virtual tours, if you're not near London, then click on virtual tours and you can find out, you know, ideas and uh, getting in touch with guides who will do uh, virtual tours as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura, for a really fabulous presentation today. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us again. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Lots of people from uh, uh, all over the world still still you know joining in. So lovely to hear from you all. Um, and join us next week. We're just confirming what we're going to do next week. And uh, it might be might be a slightly different format to the ones we've done before. So we'll we'll let you know. Uh, well, join us next week to uh, to find out uh, what it's going to be and have a really lovely week uh, in, until then so thank you all thank you uh, goodbye